three, two, one. Hello, I'm Joe Barnard. I built this rocket, which is less of a rocket and more of two crunched tubes at this point. Most of the information that you might want about this, if you don't know already, is covered in the video about flight one, which is linked below. The main thing that failed in this flight is the motor ejection system, which takes the ascent motor and pops it out, slots the landing motor in place so we can fire it. Before we talk about that specific failure, I wanna talk about the changes that I made between flights one and two. The biggest visual change from flight one to flight two is the landing legs, which have these syringes attached to them now. The landing legs have been a problem since day one of trying to land one of these things propulsively. There's always bounce or hop or slide or all sorts of problems that make it so that we tip over on landing on what would otherwise be a good upright like success. I used syringes on flight two as a sort of gas damper slash shock absorber, but I went through a painstaking process of trial and error to arrive here. I tried spikes into the dirt, but that was difficult because dirt isn't consistent across different moistures and different locations. I tried crush cores with aluminum foil that was rolled up to dissipate the energy on impact, but that only works if you're landing on like a hard, flat, easy to slide on surface. I even tried dampers that were made of 3D printed segments where the carbon fiber rod could slide in and out of the segment, and the problem there was that the static friction was very high while the dynamic friction was very low. The syringes were a nice even ground between all of these things that I tested. Most of the syringes vents through a small hole to limit flow rate, and then around one centimeter from the bottom, we pass the relief hole, and past that point, the air inside the syringe is compressed. This helps us dissipate just a little bit of energy on impact, although it is certainly not the most sleek looking solution. And while this might have worked, we'll never actually know because A, the legs did not deploy on this flight, we were coming down too fast, and B, I am changing the design again so that we probably won't fly with the syringe legs. Another thing that changed on this flight has to do with GPS. If you will remember from flight one, we had a lot of problems with GPS connectivity, having very high uncertainties and like a lot of measurement noise in our GPS. Check out these two views from the ground station of two different flights. One is from Sprint, the vehicle I built before Scout, and the other is from Scout on flight one. Sprint has a ton of GPS satellites and relatively low uncertainties, which means that we are getting really good position and velocity data from the GPS antenna. Scout's connection is a lot more rough with far fewer sats and higher uncertainties. Because RF is essentially black magic, it took a long time to correlate and determine what was causing all of the GPS noise on that first flight of Scout. It ended up being a combination of RF noise from the high-speed cameras, which are on the vehicle, there are four on here, as well as bad placement of the telemetry antenna, not just the radio, but the antenna itself was seated right on top of sensitive antenna traces for the GPS. So we were basically screaming telemetry into very sensitive traces on the PCB. There are always lots of ways to solve problems. So one of them would obviously be to move the telemetry antenna so that we're not sending all of that telemetry into the GPS antenna. But instead of doing that, an easier solution was to look at how can we make the existing hardware work and fix it in software. So in order to do this, the only hardware change I made was remove the antenna from the telemetry radio, which had the small side effect of burning out the telemetry radio pretty bad, uh, but then had the side effect of improving the GPS signal because the telemetry radio took itself offline. More importantly than both of these things though, is that I started using an approach called dead reckoning instead of using any GPS data at all. Dead reckoning is how a lot of ICBMs work and also submarines and a bunch of things, frankly. The idea is that you have inertial sensors on board and you don't want to trust anything outside. So you propagate forward the accelerations and the rotations that you can measure 
And then if you do that, if you integrate acceleration, you get velocity. If you integrate velocity, you get position. And you can have some estimate, even if it's degraded, of where you are. Of course, this is great in theory, but it's difficult in practice because accelerometers are noisy devices, especially the cell phone grade accelerometers and gyros that we're using on here. These are, oh, sorry. These are noisy sensors, and so as you propagate those errors forward, your estimate of where you are and how fast you're moving is going to degrade over time. The good news here is that these flights are like 10 seconds maximum, so we don't have a lot of time to degrade over. The other problem that can contribute to dead reckoning errors over time is your initial estimates of where you are and where you're pointed. If you start out with data that is incorrect, that data is only going to get more incorrect as you go forward. So one of the main things we focused on for this flight was no that the vehicle was perfectly vertical on the launch pad. And you know, you look at it and it's like, dude, this looks straight, it's fine. But something as low as like 0.2 degrees can ruin your estimates over the course of 10 seconds. So for Scout Flight 2, I got out my high precision laser level and leveled the crap out of this launch pad so we knew it would be upright. If we take a look at the altitude plot here, this is all the dead reckoning data. So we're not considering our barometric altitude. We're not considering anything other than propagating that accelerometer forward when we hit that impact spike, we think that we are 27 centimeters off the ground, which is not that bad for propagating accelerations, the double derivative forward uh, for position. The last thing that I changed between flight one and flight two were the attitude control gains on ascent, which is basically how aggressive are we trying to keep the vehicle upright and pointed at the set point. We were a little bit too chill on this last time and I sort of got away with it because the vehicle naturally pitched over in the right direction down range. But for this flight, I jacked those gains up from a two to a five. I more than doubled them, which is why you see just a little bit of wiggle on ascent but we're also totally locked in on attitude. Flight two looked really nice in pitch and yaw. We did have a pretty solid overshoot when we hit that pitch over portion on ascent. I believe that was because of a jam in the TVC mount, and this may also have contributed to the motor ejection problems. The servo cables that run up the inside of the airframe can sometimes get in the way of a full actuation of the mount when there are two motors in there, which brings me to my next topic of motor ejection. The dual motor mount for Scout is genuinely, I will toot my own horn, beep, 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 it's a work of art. I am very proud of this design. That said, like a work of art, it is also very delicate. With the servos I used and the way this mount is built, it's just barely able to knock that ascent motor out of the way to slot the landing motor in place. If you've ever like held a wired PlayStation controller that only works if you hold the cable in the right way, or you press the buttons a certain way, or like maybe you have a phone that when you plug it in, you have to like push the cable up a little bit for it to work. And so the case is basically this thing works and works and works and works until it doesn't. And you don't really have a good sense of like where that line is. That is a great metaphor for how this mount works. It works and works and works and then it doesn't. And it's really hard to determine exactly what is pushing it over the edge between working and not working. When the motor fails to eject, it stays in place even when the landing motor fires. I never designed this with a way to detect if the ejection on the motor mount had been successful and like hindsight 2020 would have been a great idea. So the landing motor fires, which does complete the ejection process for the ascent motor, but because the landing motor is firing, it's thrusting up into the rocket, we don't slot that landing motor into place, which means that we stay firing recessed within a tube. This subjects the motor to something called the Krusnik effect, which is something I'm sort of experimenting with right now for throttling of solid motors. A very simplified version of this is that if you put a sleeve around the motor and then recess the motor within that sleeve, you start to get a little bit of throttle control on the solid motor. This process is chaotic, it's turbulent, it is hard to predict, so I'm running a bunch of firing tests with these rocket motors to see what kind of control can we really get here. That's a different topic, but basically that's what happens on this flight. We lose a lot of the thrust we should have when we fire that landing motor, which is why we hit the ground so hard. Before launch, I tested this ejection system again and again and again, and it's hard to know exactly what part of it failed in flight. It's even harder to know because I had a bunch of camera failures, maybe more camera failures than I have ever had on this flight. The only cameras that worked were the reaction wheel camera internally and the down looking camera, which stopped like halfway through the flight. Between these failures, the ejection system failing, and a whole bunch of minor things, I think there is a lesson to be learned here, which is that 
you shouldn't wait 10 months to fly again if you have like relatively minor fixes to make because you lose a lot of the knowledge that it takes to operate the system in that time. Between flights one and two, I was either too focused on other projects or too afraid to fly this thing to actually, oh my gosh, okay. But I was too afraid to fly this thing to actually get it off the ground because I was scared that it would you know, meet this end. I did want to see this thing land, but more than that, I had poured everything that I had last fall into this vehicle, and I didn't want to potentially see it break in this way or worse. And I never had to find out if it was ever capable of landing if I never flew it. So moving forward, we were definitely not done with the landing stuff. I was pretty convinced this was the one that was gonna make it, and now I'm convinced the next one will do it. Continuing with the letter name scheme, we'll call it Scout F, which is maybe appropriate. And as for the changes, here is what I have in mind. We're gonna ditch the GPS, and just like Flight 2, we're gonna use only dead reckoning to keep avionics and all of the electronics a little bit more simple within the airframe, and it'll save us just a tiny bit of weight. We are gonna throttle. We're actually doing throttle control now. Um, as I said before, I am experimenting with the Krushnik effect throttling, we're not quite getting the amount of throttle that I want. I can easily get like 10%, but I really want 20 or 30. Um, so however it happens, we are going to have throttle control, and throttle control enables us to fix two other problems, which is landing legs and like targeted landing, um, which sounds like a missile. It's not a missile. Especially from the sprint program and the sprite program, we know that I can do position control on these vehicles. And if we have throttle control, we don't need to do that big old divert maneuver, that sine wave divert. The math behind it is cool. The simulations do close. It does seem neat, but um, it was less simple than I thought in practice. So with throttle control, we should have the ability to land in a specified spot, maybe one or two meters of a box, depending on what dead reckoning like accuracy math shows us. And the big deal with that is that we can have an actual landing pad where I get to choose the material, I get to choose the spring coefficient on touchdown, I get to control all of those things about how this thing touches down, which solves a lot of the problems that we were having trying to design landing legs that could work on any type of grass, which is a huge variable. The legs will probably end up changing because of that too. I do not yet know how the legs will change and we'll need to do a bunch of tests dropping it again to see if we can minimize that bounce and then let this thing slide across the surface. That's another thing that I know that Falcon 9 was designed with, especially the drone ship. When the vehicle touches down on that drone ship, it is designed to slide on the surface. Finally, we are ditching the motor ejection system. I had a good run, it was a very cool idea, and I could never get it to work quite as well as I wanted. With the addition of some sort of throttling mechanism, whether it is plume impingement or Krush like a Krushnik effect sleeve on there, we're probably not going to have the room to keep the rocket motor ejection system, and that will solve a lot of like the other TVC problems here. So my new plan is to have a very small stage at the very bottom of the rocket that basically just contains a motor and maybe a mount. If you've seen the video on the small board that I built, um, this is essentially the idea. We'd have a totally self-contained stage, maybe we'd get signal from Ava, but we drop this off right at burnout, and then the vehicle exists as a regular looking rocket on the way down. A lot of this stuff hasn't been designed yet. I'm still just sort of in the concept phase, so we'll see if any of this holds, but that's sort of what I'm looking at. Next up on the channel, I'm gonna publish the full, however long it is, engineering cut for Scout E. Dude, it's like a solid hour and a half, maybe two hours so far. Uh, this thing is intense. <laughs> I have a ton of footage that I talked about that I was sitting on since last November of building and designing this thing, and what good is it if I'm just gonna keep it to myself? So I'm gonna publish the full engineering cut. It'll be a more rough video, but I think it'll be enjoyable to see the design and build process for this thing. But before any of that stuff happens, it is sponsor time. So thank you to today's sponsor, which is Brilliant. I've talked about them before on this channel, but for those who don't know, Brilliant is a platform which focuses on active problem solving through real exercises that you can interact with. The platform focuses on topics within STEM, which stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. I know this is true for a lot of people, but for me personally, I learn much better when I'm focused on a real and present problem, which is to say that I prefer learning by experimentation and interaction rather than learning from a textbook or something that's a little bit more dry. Instead of learning the rules 
and formulas for how something works, you can use Brilliant to interact with the problem and prove out the solution for yourself. Brilliant offers a whole bunch of courses that you can start with today to further your education in science, technology, math, and you can start at any skill level. If you'd like to get started with Brilliant and join a growing community of people doing the same, you can do that by visiting the link in the description below or heading to brilliant.org slash BPS space. Thank you very much to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video and thanks to you for watching. My name is Joe Barnard, may your skies be blue and your winds be low.